for all you out there on the internet, we're uh, we are here in this lovely place, the Passion Fruit Lodge, uh, in Costa Rica on the Caribbean side, in a little town called Cahuita, and uh, we're actually doing this podcast. This is the first video podcast for the Bartcast. So just to give a little background, uh, me and Lisa, we met, what has it been, like two weeks now or I more? I think it's more than two weeks. Three weeks, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So we met at, on a yoga retreat uh, in this town, Arenal, uh, in a, at a res- retreat center called Essence. We, uh, we decided to, to go on this journey together to the Caribbean side. You know, my first impression of Lisa, I was like, who's this woman who's six months pregnant, just (laughs) traveling by herself, like so, so brave and so fierce and and just setting off into the unknown. I thought, I thought like how interesting I got to know who this person is, what her story is. And, uh, and I feel like in spending this time, we've grown like a really cool friendship and definitely done yeah. some hot springs traveled dro- driven into the darkness um and we've like talked a lot and we've talked a lot we've probably had at least four podcasts yeah. already <laughs> without the mics so um i'm hoping that we can capture some of that spirit for this one because we've had some really interesting conversations mm-hmm. and uh yeah what was your, i'm curious what was your first impression of me when when you met me do you remember um i still remember i th- i think the first time i saw you was at the at the yoga class mm. and but then like my f- my my real first impression i got was at the tamas Kal, mm, and yeah. it was pretty vulnerable because we're all we were all in there sweating it was dark and you were sharing your stories and i remember how I could relate to that story because you were talking about your your trauma and your childhood and I was like wow and that was impressing to me yeah mm, still remember you. that yeah that was it was it was an interesting experience you know for for those of you who are wondering what a temescal is it's uh, at this retreat center part of the retreat uh, we got to engage in like an indigenous ceremony kind of like a sweat lodge mm-hmm. uh, in this big like what is it made out of like clay almost or stucco it looks or like an igloo a little yeah it's kind of like a stone igloo and they build a fire on one side of it we didn't have the volcanic rocks on this one but they had this fire going and we went in it was dark and we did chants and songs and yeah and you really sweat it's like a spiritual sauna like i like that healing sauna yeah healing sauna with herbs it was there were smells, not just each other's, but also the spices. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and then we started, we did like these intentions and then we started honoring our parents. And, and one of the things that struck me was just how when you're around a group of strangers, in some ways it's almost easier to get vulnerable and deep. It's like nobody has these preconceived ideas about who you are, so... I don't know about you, but I felt like safe yeah. sharing some things that maybe around my best friends, I wouldn't have felt mm-hmm. as comfortable. But also because the other person, they were vulnerable too. So they shared right. their stories and one one started to be like really vulnerable and sharing their thoughts, their emotions, their feelings, their an- anxiety and everything they're going through right now. And um, I think that's what... Um, yeah made the ice break a little and yeah yeah Yeah, totally and we had great leaders the two women that led the ceremony both Adelina and Kat like were bringing in their own influence and really setting the stage for all of us to to get honest and get get vulnerable about our stories Mm -hmm. and yeah I felt that connection to you too Mm -hmm. like we we both had have a serious I think a similar background story of of the ho- homes that we grew up in and just being on this this path of healing from our trauma and trying to not let it continue to dictate the the ways that we show up mm-hmm. for the people in our lives and the ways that we kind of 
define our own potential because as we've talked about many times like how limiting can it be Mm -hmm. like we're all you hear people say like you're your own worst enemy or you know you set your own limits but I find so often like those limits can be operating subconsciously like you might think like I'm fine I've always been this way it's you know these things are hard these things are easy and when you start to dig deeper and peel back the layers uh, I know for myself it's been really revealing just like what's going on below the surface of conscious thought Mm -hmm. that's having an effect on on how I you know behave and and think about life and uh, kind of categorize situations mm-hmm. yeah i mean it's like it's like peeling peeling an onion like every time you get a little deeper once you start it you you cannot you ca- you, you also cannot stop like mm. it's uh when you, once you start um the healing process it's like you you're not getting addicted to it but you're like i really don't want this to impact me anymore because trauma has an impact um has such a such a such a huge impact on all of our life choices on our relationships on our finances the career our friendships like almost everything and once you figure out that it has it does not have to be that that way you can try to to switch it and try to yeah write another story Mm -hmm. you know tell another story from this day on do you remember how how old you were when you first started looking at your trauma and thinking about healing it? Like, would you, was there a moment where, where that journey started for you? Yeah, there was. I don't know. I don't remember how old I was. I was probably 23 or 24, I think. I, I, I was at a point in my life where I was like sitting in my apartment and I felt so lonely and I had those weird thoughts coming up, and then I was like, "Okay, I need to, I need to get help right now. Mm. Otherwise, I don't know if I'm gonna survive um, again." Again, you yeah. know, I mean, I mean, it's one thing to survive the trauma, to be a survivor, but then the other thing is to survive the healing, like the because you're always re-traumatizing yourself again. You're repeating those patterns, yeah. and to survive that is another like story another kind of story right. and i remember saying to myself i cannot go on like that and then i i went into a bookshop um i started psychotherapy and i went into a bookshop and i remember i grabbed this book about kundalini yoga and um it was like there was so much wisdom in this book that i was like um it fascinated me and it helped me in a way I could have never imagined. And that's when my yoga journey began and my meditation journey. But meditation, I started I started um, later. But my, jo- my yoga journey began. And a um, few years after that, maybe two years, I decided to k- become a yoga teacher and to go to Hawaii and it was the first time in my life where I was in this big spiritual community community connecting with people yeah that's how it started and um yeah I'm I'm diving deeper into it more and more and especially right now after ayahuasca after I did my first ayahuasca ceremony yeah and like Bufo with the psychedelics it's like, yeah, everything came at the right moment okay. in my life. I mean, it, the the first thing that sticks out to me when when I hear that story that you just told is just how much strength you had even in the beginning of deciding to dive in, like making the choice to, to heal. That's usually, I feel like, where a lot of people get caught up and can take decades even if you're aware that you're carrying trauma, like not everybody's first instinct is like, okay, I have to go into healing. I'm going to get therapy. I'm going to get into Kundalini or, you know, like it's amazing that you have this type of brain where you're able to, uh, to kind of take the initiative and, and to activate. And I know for myself, it took me years of like thinking about going to yoga, thinking about going Mm -hmm. to therapy 
putting <laughs> it off. You know, my own my own trauma patterns mm-hmm. would affect even my ability to to start the healing process. Thinking mm-hmm. about starting your dream job, like or quitting your job, right. it's just always. You know, you have to be aware that as long as you don't change your behavior, if as long as you don't do something, you will always continue the same pattern and you will always ig- experience this the same the, the same things. Like how how do you expect to have another outcome, a different outcome if you're not changing? And you cannot just look at the outside world and say oh it's his fault my relationship like i had i struggled so much in relationships and i always thought yeah this is just an asshole (laughs) (laughs) yeah just projecting but at one point in my life i was like yeah but why do i keep um having relationships that are not meant to be and like um why do i always why do i always have to go through a breakup and starting to see that yeah maybe he he was an asshole but i also have my own demons and my own shadow and i have to work on that because i cannot change the other person i can i can just change myself and i truly believe that what i see on the outside is a reflection um of my inside Mm. yeah that's a powerful one like we It kind of gets back to what I was saying, like as thinking, feeling creatures, all we have to experience the world and create reality are our own tools of perception. Yes. And if you're working with broken tools, your reality is going to be affected by that. And I think that a lot, I think that a lot of healing, at least for myself, maybe other people feel this way too, but like a huge part of healing is realizing like, what are the things that are affecting my perception of mm-hmm. reality and how is that building, you know, a narrative and a reality that doesn't necessarily make me happy? Yeah. Doesn't fulfill me. It, it isn't often we think of it as like material things in our life like, oh, I didn't get the job or, oh, I suck at math or, oh, I, I just can't like I'm just terrible with women, you know. Uh, and those are like kind of crutches at times. Those are narratives that we can kind of lean on because it's comfortable Mm because we've accepted it. But then once you start to, like you said, peel back those layers and break it down, I think it becomes more and more clear of like, oh, no, there's like some root shit that you happened usually in childhood where this narrative got set in my brain and I'm filtering every new experience through that story and, and looking, you know, you think about these days, like everybody goes online to like, find information to add to their own narrative Mm -hmm. it's a common thing that people talk about and i think we're always doing that like i have a story about who i am i have a new experience i'm looking for the patterns in that experience that are going to feed that story that story and the thing is is it doesn't always have to be negative like one of the things we that i've learned i keep learning i keep having to relearn is like we all have the power to decide to start building positive narrative stories and then when we encounter these situations we can look like how is this building that positive narrative you know i think that's a big part of the work it's so true because the story we tell ourselves is our really is is becoming our reality you know and i like that's when i when i when I right now, like, um, I'm feeling kind of anxious. I'm feeling kind of like a loser. Mm. I mean, those feelings still, they still come up. But then I'm, I'm trying to look back. I'm trying to look where was I um, five or ten years ago? And what, what beliefs did I have back then? Mm. And then I remind myself that I had such a different story about my health, for example. Like... I had such a different consciousness about about health choices and um, I mean I was smoking I was drinking now I'm a complete different person in in like in regard to that yeah and I'm so happy that I just I, I just changed the story because I became aware that it doesn't serve me anymore and it's in my power to change it and I think that's how we can look at our stars we can look at the things we're not feeling comfortable with right now or we are like the the struggles we're going through and then thinking about the stories we're telling ourselves every day and every day and every day and our brain will do anything to 
to prove us right, you know? Hell yeah. So. And I think that's a great segue into talking about uh, some epigenetics. What do you think about that? Yeah, of course. So, you know, for all you listeners out there, all you watchers out there, uh, Lisa is currently, you're currently studying to be an epigenetic coach, correct? Yes, right. Can you give everyone just like a basic uh, definition of what epigenetics are and what epigenetic coaching is all about so that people can have that idea? Yeah, so like um, epigenetic is not that not that famous because it's um, totally new in science and um, doctors and all kinds of scientists always always thought that everything is programmed by our genes mm. and that our genes are super important and um, everything else doesn't matter. But what we found out is that the environment and the sur- um, surrounding we are putting our genes into is much more important than the gene because it um, tells the gene to go on or go off. Mm. So we can what we can do is by changing our surrounding, we can change our health, we can change our body. And um, yeah, that's, that's probably it. So it's all about how your diet and how your lifestyle and all those kind of life choices is, an, is impacting your health and that you don't have to be a victim. Even if your mom or your dad or your grandmom had cancer or diabetes or other sorts of chronic illnesses, you don't have to be a victim. You don't have to believe that this is the same thing that will happen to you because you can't have those, those genes but you can control if they're expressed or not. Yeah. So it's kind of like taking this uh, mind over matter philosophy that we have heard from the New Agers, right, for decades, but it's actually applying like a scientific basis to it. Is that correct? Yeah, it's like really scientific. It's like modern spirituality, mm-hmm. but it's like really proven science and... Um, it's um, super important to become aware how all those things, those impacts, my diet, my my movement, my, but also my transgenerational trauma, like the trauma I stored in my body or even the trauma my dad or my granddad stored in his body is still they're still giving it to me like they're still mm. giving it to the next generation and how. No, it's my, it's my work to heal that trauma, to not like uh, experience the same health issues. Mm. Yeah, it reminds me of, I forget the name of the study, but there was a study a couple years ago where they took mice and they put them in like shallow water with an electric current and they mm-hmm. shocked the mice. And I think they found that like even two generations later, when they would put the children of those mice in water, yeah. they would have like a fear response. Yeah, definitely. That's an epigenetic exp- experiment. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. So that's it. You know, it's 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 really cool to hear because it's total cutting it. This is total cutting edge scientific stuff. And I think wh- another one that I heard was like how apparently human babies have a natural like tendency to avoid snakes and like shapes. Yeah. snake like shapes like it's there's some sort of there's some genetic memory in there definitely i mean evolution is part of the epigenetic process i mean for example if you're like super stressed mm-hmm. um as a man you're super stressed and then you fertilize a woman this information that you are surrounded by so much that you're in such a stressful environment is giving is still in your sperm and it's giving to the baby so that the the baby can develop bigger um, adrenaline glands to produce more adrenaline, to produce more stress hormones because wow. it has to be prepared for the environment. So it's like evolution. It totally makes sense. It's the same thing with if you, if your grandparents, they experienced war and they experienced like starvation and like hunger, then you can still have some metabolism problems, like problems with your metabolism and your your whole 
your your health because it's still it has a it makes sense because i mean the body is like oh i still have to be prepared for that mm. so i have to keep the metabolism down it always makes sense it's not that we're just getting sick because there's some evil in our body mm -hmm. interesting so fellas it's not enough to have sex to relax you gotta meditate before <laughs> you have sex you gotta come if in you want to have a baby yeah. i would recommend that <laughs> But also, yeah, <laughs> I would really recommend that. Yeah. yeah. And if you're if you have tr trouble with your diet, like it might be because your, you know, grandparents were in World War Two or something. Yeah, it could be. That's why in epigenetics, when you coach, yeah. you also you're, you're not just looking at the client. You're also looking at the generations before mm. what that they experience. Yeah. Like what what um, kind of trauma do they um, did they have to go through? So that you can see as a as an epigenetic coach, oh okay, um, that's why maybe you develop this um, this health issue. So. Yeah, can you walk me through like, uh, you know, as an epigenetic coach when you're working with a client, can you walk me through like the process of uh, how you go about um, identifying? like their issues and then working towards like, you know, a healing strategy. Like how does that process look, look like? I think it's, it's always different. It depends on the goal um, the client has. Mm -hmm. But if you're just coming to me and you're just like, I'm struggling with almost everything, like with my health, with my life choices, I'm unhappy. I have stress. I, I'm not able to um, have he healthy relationships. Then I would start, um, asking you what what do you want to work on first and then um i would spend i think i would spend like an hour first just listening to you and you're like um finding out what you struggle the most with right now mm -hmm. then i would do uh, probably recommend some tests for for the body to see okay first first thing we have to do and that's almost um always like this is to change the diet or a fact in the diet like to to add something or leave something away um that's the fir first thing and then developing a plan because you cannot like i mean just imagine you're someone who's like totally out of control right now nothing's going going mm -hmm. well in your life yeah i cannot tell you okay now you have to do those 20 things and then <laughs> add, like, because then you freak out it's I'm overwhelming back, yeah, you know <laughs> So we have to start one thing at a time mm -hmm. and um, see what's now the most important thing. Okay. Yeah. So it's like really depending what is really important right now. We start with that and then. Can you talk about on. some specific like modalities that you work in? Like as far as like what are the specific therapies that, that are used in epigenetic coaching for, for healing like. You mentioned like you you do testing to identify you know where why are certain things being expressed like why is the cancer uh, gene being expressed in this situation um, and you mentioned a little bit about the power of these different you know spiritual practices or therapies or diet. <clears throat> um, can you go into a little more detail about how those mechanisms influence the the cells and the way that they read genes oh they're like for ex um, example um, for cancer they're like oppressor and suppressor genes okay so just to clarify the like the suppressor genes that's like the the genes that are telling your body to kill the cancer yeah yeah gotcha. because i mean it's every time there's no ex um, exception for this every time you get sick Mm -hmm. and you c get like in cr like a chronic disease it means there's something out of balance yeah and holistic healing and that is what we do in epigenetic is to really see like what what does that what, what does that have to do with the soul your trauma your mental health right now what does it have to do with your diet what kind of supplements can you take what kind of herbs and plants can you use you it's a really like really really holistic you have to s because just 
doing one thing and just maybe looking on the diet and say, okay, your diet is not optimal, we have to change it, probably will not make the cancer go away. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's always holistic. Yeah, you hear these stories about people who have like stage four cancer. I think we met a couple even on this trip. And the reductionist model, which is kind of the dominant model in, in like Western medicine, is to go into the hospital. Okay, we're going to give you chemotherapy or we're going to cut out the tumor. We're going to zap it with uh, interferon and then... We're aiming for it to get rid of these symptoms and we're going to go in and just like, you know, not look at the whole rest of the system, but we're going to look at this one facet. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like what you're saying, which I believe very deeply is what we need to be focusing more on in our modern healthcare system is like viewing the body as this complex system and having your healthcare providers, uh, you know, we can go even deeper into the problems with that, but just having these healthcare providers be able to look at the system and all its complexity yeah. and, and find these holistic pr- approaches where it's not just about taking the pill to fix the one problem. It's really like so much I've found in my own health and I've heard from other people like disease isn't this evil thing that comes and happens no. to you. It's kind of like the disease is like, okay, it's time for you to either change, change your life fundamentally or I'm um, like it's your body basically saying it's time for you to change fundamentally or you're going to die you yeah. know for a lot of people it gets to that point and that's when they finally have that the stakes are high enough to see the light and you know uh they they make hopefully are able to make the changes but I do think like having people like yourself who are you know th- there aren't many resources in this in this realm yet you know, relative, you know, most people aren't even aware of epigenetics or, um, or trauma or trauma. And, uh, so it's, you know, this is, I think this is really much needed in the world. Definitely. I mean, you cannot separate the body from the soul. It's a, it's a union. What do you, when you use the word soul, like what, what does that word mean to you? What do you use that word to represent? I mean, for me, depends on um, how you're feeling about it. I think it doesn't, like, as as an epigenetic coach, it doesn't matter how I would define that word. It's more how you would define it. And Mm -hmm. if you, like, would not believe in the soul, I will tell you. Yeah, I mean your psyche. Okay. I mean, mean, there's, you're just not your body, right? Mm -hmm. If I would tell you you're your arm, you would say no. Mm Mm-hmm. So, and you're also not like this whole body. Yeah, you're more, yeah. Yeah, much more than that. And I would tell you, what is, what's with your mental health? What's with, with, with your psyche right now? Gotcha. What's with the experience you made in the past? And yeah. how do they still impact you? And I think um, that's one thing we, st- we really have to, to focus on. And because like school medicine is more focused on suppressing the symptoms, like to treat the symptoms. Um, but if you like, if you cut out a tumor, you have no guarantee it, it doesn't come back. It doesn't grow right. back, you know. And yeah. like, this is a sign from your body. You now have to start your healing journey. Mm. You yeah. have to start your healing journey right now because, also, like, let's say you have such a bad diet, and it's part why the the chronic disease developed. Also, having such a bad diet and treating yourself in such a bad way is a trauma response right you know it's yeah. not it's not just like yeah i'm just a lazy person mm-hmm. whatever it is if you're smoking cigarettes if you're drinking if you have a bad diet yeah. um if you're not moving if you're not acting in a way that shows that you really love and appreciate yourself and your body it is a trauma response it is because you experience trauma and you still think maybe in your in your belief system you're not worth it. You're not worth of health. Like you're not worthy of health. Right. Uh, you're not worthy of of a high quality lifestyle. You know, whatever it is, it's destructive. It's destructive behavior, and that has an underlying issue. And the this illness just shows you, or this disease shows you, you have to start your healing journey now. At one point, it will be too late. Yeah, th- th- I mean those 
those that's how those patterns get reinforced right because like I've found in my own healing such a fundamental thing like one of the things I had to really look at before I could move past a lot of my trauma was like I'm being mean to myself almost daily like I had to become my own friend again and learn how to love myself and that's always a balance that I'm either struggling with or succeeding with uh but one of the things I found was that I had this narrative of where there'd be a behavior that I knew was bad for me and that I didn't really want to do. And there was almost this like perverse satisfaction in still doing it. Yeah. Like I knew it was bad and I would get, I would feel bad about doing it and that would actually drive me to do it more. And so part, what yeah, I had to it's do, cause it's a punishment. Right. And so what I had to do was like first, before I stopped the behavior, I had to change the narrative about the behavior and how I was talking to myself about doing it. I started doing, I was still doing the stuff that maybe was out of balance, but I started doing it with more intention. Like, okay, I'm going to be a schmuck. You know, I'm going to be, I've talked about it on this podcast before. Like I might smoke weed and stay up till 4 a.m., but like I'm making the choice to do it now. Yeah, I, it's okay to be in my... Like I call that the the shadow child. Right. Um. I'm I, I'm like or in my in my hurt inner child. I'm okay. I'm okay, and um, it's okay to be the hurt inner child right now. Yeah. And to repeat those un maybe unhealthy patterns, mm -hmm. but I think yeah that the worst the worst thing you can do is when you start your healing journey, like becoming so strict and so. Like s punishing yourself and judging yourself in your head for the things you're not doing right right now, yeah. because then it gets worse. The first thing you have to start in your healing journey is learning how to be kind to yourself, how to talk in a loving way to yourself, um, in, the, in in the most compassionate way, because it's your it's your it's your poor small inner child that is hurt that wants to continue this behavior, and you now have to be super super friendly and super kind to that child so that it doesn't show up um like every day yeah yeah we it, it brings to mind the idea of like something i've been working on a lot this last year but how can i be a better internal parent to my yeah. internal child because and i think that we both share this in our history like in the you know growing up in a traumatic home having abuse as a kid, uh, the modeling of what healthy parenting behavior looked like, it wasn't always something that, that was really going to be in a health-focused perspective. And so mm -hmm. as we become adults and as we start, um, uh, I know as I started examining my patterns that were no longer serving me, that was a big one. It was like, okay, like, you know, like you mentioned earlier, I have a problem a lot with being super productive or whatever my idea of productivity is, I fail to meet that. So one of the things I noticed was like, okay, what does like a healthy relationship with a boss look like or like a parent? And I realized that when it was time to get to work, I would sit down and the voice that would come into my head would be either that of like a parent, like telling me to work in an, un in an unfriendly way Or it would be like an old boss that I had that was super traumatic and would exploit me. And, and this is the voice that I'm telling myself. Like, how am I going to ever get any work done if that's, you know, what I'm telling myself I need to do? And, yeah. and that's what my idea of work is, is hearing that voice. So, like, that's what I've been working on in the last few months is, like, how do I change that internal dialogue so that when I hear the voice, it's like a loving voice mm -hmm. that's encouraging me, that's supporting me, that's... So that when I show up to do my work, I get to feel good. I get to feel supported, you know, but it's hard. You know, you have a bad day. Suddenly you're dealing with a boss from five years ago that was stressing you out all the time. Yeah. You know? And I mean, all your inner child wants is to be seen. Mm. And um, I think once you start to see it and once you're like, um, I am being the parent right now that I that I w was wishing for like my all my almost my whole childhood mm -hmm. I'm being this parent right now then you can then you can like remodel everything and you can write a new story and you can tell a new story and um I think it's super important 
to because also it likes it changes your brain like really you can go back your cell your cells your brain cells they they don't know it um you can go back in your childhood you can go back to those really painful moments and then trying to imagine how your dream parent would have shown up mm, okay you know I you like can this. like you can do that in a meditation like go back to those really painful moments and then imagine imagine just an adult person that can be you right now as an adult adult mm -hmm. that can be a to total stranger or it can um, either be one of your parents and then just imagine and visualizing how would the um perfect reaction um how would that feel to me like mm. how would i how would i felt if i um if i would have been seen if i would have been heard you know it's and then like it's you're like you're changing you're changing the trauma in your brain like yeah. you're really changing the brain structure because you're going back to the trauma again and your brain doesn't know it's like actually like you're not doing it you cannot go back in the past that that's what your brain doesn't know yes the cell doesn't know ah. so you're going back and you you write and tell a new story yeah you're like you're you're going back to that moment the root moment of trauma and then you're kind of like reassociating with the moment putting yourself back in that space and then changing the outcome yeah changing the and outcome. what you're saying is that your brain doesn't know the difference and so you're able to kind of rewire yeah, your you emotions about that it's funny that you say it because that's almost exactly that what what uh we did with the timeline therapy yeah. when i was working with nico at essence like that was kind of what we were doing was going mm -hmm. back to those root causes and then creating a new signal path for our neurons so that when i think like we were talking about in this conversation when i encounter a new situation that has similarities the original traumatic situation rather than re-traumatizing i now have the option and the tools to feed that information into the new signal path that i've created and strengthen it yeah and you do that you know a million times in your life and it's going to build that narrative that much stronger Definitely. It's, it's really and it's so like it's so powerful how you could see um, in a scan, in a brain scan, how it changed your brain. Really? Like it really changes the part because trauma changes your brain. Mm. When you're a child and you're like um, mm. experience lots of abu abuse, your brain is different different um, to, to a child who like who who's not ha um, had that experience, you know? Mm -hmm. So what you can do is try to heal that part of your brain by yeah going back creating a new outcome and Im like you really imagine and vi visualize how how someone i mean it can be you it can be a stranger or your parents how how would it be if they would have react differently how would it be how would it felt if i was always right where i am right now how, how would it felt if i i was like feeling loved and i know that i'm valued no matter yeah. what i do that changes so much right going back and just thinking i was loved as a child because now i'm an adult and i can go back and i can heal my inner child i can go back to my inner child and i can mm. say i love you i love you so much and you're so strong and you're right and like this there's nothing wrong with you you're just perfect the way you are yeah that can change so much and yeah. it has such a healing potential it's almost like you're doing inception on your own mind you know like the movie <laughs> yeah <laughs> implanting these thoughts that are going to take on a new blossom like in a viral way yeah it's like we've all i'm sure you've had this experience too but like we all have that friend who like it just seems to float through life you know mm -hmm. like they have that smile and they have that like it, they had the upbringing that was full of love and support and the way that they view life it's just why wouldn't they ever expect that things were going to work out and be and be yeah, good you definitely. know and i have friends like that where i'm like man like and the older I get, the more I start to realize like, oh, that's what 
that kind of parenting does. It's not like that, you know, it, it really does like change the fabric of reality for your kids so that, you know, you're like setting this, this structure in their mind where every new, they've already got the positive track, the yes. positive narrative. So they're always filtering their experiences yes. through that. And I do know that some of those friends, when they do encounter adversity, it, it can be really hard for them, mm-hmm. you know? And so th- that's why it's not that they're having the perfect life. They're going to have they're building struggles. up resilience. Exactly. They you have know, the, like the natural tools to, to uh, adjust and roll with the punches and, yeah definitely and i think that's like i i my biggest wish would be for all parents to to become aware um that it has such an such an impact how you raise your child and how and what kind of a feeling you give to your you're giving to your children are they right like no matter what they do do they still feel that unconditional love? Mm. And um, are you the, their, their safe place? I think w- as a parent, when you're their safe place, they like the whole world becomes their safe place. Right. You know, and that's so, so powerful. And I was like, I, I, I remember doing that, um, going on like um, tripping on mushrooms one day. Mm-hmm. And I was like, um, there was at a time where I was like super depressed. I I was like, I suffered from such a huge depression and I was like, okay, um, feels right tonight. Um, I'm in a good mood. (laughs) I'm gonna take some mushrooms. (laughs) And my- (laughs) That's like a good, that'd be a good start to a song. (laughs) Feels right tonight. I'm in a good mood. I'm gonna take some mushrooms. (laughs) You're like, uh, and I took them and they gave me exactly what I needed. They like, um they reconnected me with my feelings and my emotions because i felt so empty Mm -hmm. i just felt so empty and i started to cry and then i was like closing my eyes and i was tripping and it was like um like guided meditation where i just saw that i was like um in the jungle kind of in the jungle with an indigenous um with with indigenous people Mm. and two of them were my parents like my they they adopted me in kind of a way and i saw that there was a fence and behind this this fence were my like real parents and um it sounds kind of mean right now (laughs) but i think it was part of the whole healing process and i was just like okay now it's your fault i'm going going to them because here i am loved Ah. and they cried like my parents my so parents, they were standing they outside the fence so they f- in. yeah they they f- they felt like that guilt yeah. and i left them behind and i i went to my to my new parents and they were so loving i, I like i still remember those eyes like um the eyes of my mother and she was like so loving and i felt so right and i felt like i'm their first priority and their um yeah just their whole world and they they would never think of me as a human being that has like bad intentions or like you know because i sometimes felt with my real parents like that i'm an evil person Mm. you know i know that feeling (laughs) like i i I felt like i'm an evil person i'm just not right you're a demon i'm i'm a demon i'm an i'm an evil person and um I never got that feeling from from those parents. So I I got that feeling that I'm right, I'm perfect, and I'm such a loving um, um, human being and so kind, you know? And then I was asking myself, wow, that changed my whole reality. So that I um, became an adult who was like really compassionate and who was, who had lots of capacity to give to give to other people. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because that's, I think that's like a universal truth. I certainly discovered it. I've discovered it that like one of the like, if healing is like a tree, one of the fruits that blossoms on that tree when you do have that feeling of healing is wanting to share that with other people, wanting to spread that. Like in, in the timeline therapy that I did, like, the talk was like, okay, we've like emptied you out of like these 
these emotions that have been hurting you and like now you have all this spade inside let's fill that all with gratitude and focus on that and what i realized was that i did suddenly feel full of gratitude and i would have these deep powerful moments where i felt so grateful for my life and the world and all i wanted to do was like share, share. that experience share the healing i want every living being to get mm-hmm. to feel the feeling that i'm feeling in this moment you know and and i think that you hit the nail on the head right there with what you were saying that as humans we have a natural inclination towards when we when we've gotten our needs taken care of and when we're feeling like satisfied and fulfilled like it's human nature to want to share that definitely and to spread that feeling amongst everybody else i mean because we are more in our and ho- our higher selves yeah you know and our higher self always knows like um what's best for us and for the universe and for the world and i think the more capacity you you have and you develop um the more you're gonna share and the more you the more you love the more love you have inside of your heart the more love you will give to others Mm -hmm. and that's why i think it's so important um yeah to to rewrite those stories so that you can just not step into your own healing process but also inspire other people to hear and to share to heal and to share because it's the same with the the same with pain it's like a snowball snowball like pain builds up so much ego and the more ego you have the less capacity you have to feel compassion and empathy and right. um, kindness and, mm-hmm. you know, for other people, for other people. Hello. Hello. So I think, um, yeah, it's really important. And it's the same with, with love. It's getting, mm-hmm. it's beca- like a snowball is developing. If you. Yeah. S- yeah. The, the love begets the, the love just as like hate can beget hate or yeah. anger can beget anger. It, it does tend to be it sums up yeah yeah um i want to ask you about your psychedelic ex- experiences like what 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 uh what first got you into psychedelics how did you make your entry into that world what what was that experience like um to be honest i've never had an like an entrance like an entry like to like i was just doing that ashtanga yoga teacher training Mm. in mexico okay and there they said like oh right now you're here and we have those treatments for you like those are available so who wants to do kamba who wants to do bufo who wants to do ayahuasca and everyone was like me me (laughs) and i was like okay so then i have to do it um like um two i i don't want to be the only person who's not doing it and also before I came to Mas- Mexico, I knew that they have those treatments there. And I was like, I, I had no idea what ayahuasca is. Mm. I had no, okay. because I've never, I've never took psych- psychedelics before. Yeah. Like I've never, I mean, I've, I've smoked weed sometimes, but it's not a real psychedelic, but I've never like took mushrooms or mm-hmm. acid or stuff. And um, so you went in both feet into the water. You yeah, dove like right I started with Bufo. That's like the most, I think like one of the strongest psychedelics on that earth. Like, Can you, you know? tell talk about Bufo? Because I d- had never heard about of it before. You mentioned it, and I don't think it's a lot like of people from know what that it is. big what toad. Big, yeah, toad. It's, it's one of them. Licking toads. Yeah. Okay. And um, you can smoke it to be that. Is that how you ingested it? Yeah, I smoked it. So you're smoking it, and you're like you're pulling, and you're gone right away. Like I had that breakthrough after like three seconds wow like Off i had one a hit? real breakthrough just one one hit of it yeah like you're smoking you're, you're pulling like 10 seconds and then yeah. you try to hold it in and like gotcha. you like um from the first second you try i tried to hold it in i was like i had that breakthrough and then i died i was like <laughs> really I, I was really like it was really de- like a near-death experience okay so you're going you, you feel how your your body uh, how your soul is leaving your body wow Mm-hmm. Were and you you're scared? going no not at all no that's not at all afraid because the shaman um also told us 
your ego can't kick in that moment your soul wants to leave your body your mm -hmm. psyche is like don't do that like <laughs> yeah. it's dangerous right. but i was prepared and i really wanted to to feel in that experience and to get that experience the whole experience mm -hmm. so i was like no i really because i saw someone who was also pulling but not enough so he was not he, he didn't have that breakthrough gotcha and it really it doesn't it didn't seem to me like the thing i wanted i wanted mm. to break through yeah so i pulled really i pulled really deep i hauled it i was i i was dying and there was uh, you get into samadhi you get right into samadhi in yoga What's you samadhi? would call that that's what you would call like w if you are a christ um a christian um the heaven gotcha like a place Nirvana. where where time doesn't exist anymore your ego doesn't exist anymore your body does not exist anymore you don't even know who you were or are like mm. it's probably the place when you are enlightened and okay. you die and you like the buddhi would the buddhist would say you're not you're not coming back gotcha. it's the nirvana nirvana so it was like a place of it was so heart opening it was just like pure joy mm. it was pure joy it was pure I don't know. I like <laughs> even right now when I'm talking about yeah. it, I have to smile. It's such a great place to be. It's like nothing matters anymore. Mm. Like the whole pain you were going through is just like an illusion. Okay. And also like your Id your identification with your body and who you are with your stories and your belief system. It's it's not existing anymore. Mm. It's just doesn't matter. And how long and did it last? You probably say it just lasts for one minute, but it f feels like eternity right. because there's no time. Yeah. When you're there, there's no time. On and the outside, how long did it did they, did they say that it took? Uh, the first time I did Bufu was 15 minutes. Gotcha. Like, and then I came back. Yeah. And before I did it, I set the intention to forgive my mom. Mm. For because we had a huge fight before I went to Mexico, and I I suffered a lot from like um, this yeah the kind of relationship we had at that t at that time, and I really wanted to forgive her, but I I felt that something's blocking me. I don't know what, and so I was like, I want to forgive my mom. That was the only no. I want to forgive my parents. Actually, I want to forgive my parents was the intention I said before I did Bufo. And um, it was so funny because after I, I returned and then I became my mother. <laughs> my face changed huh. and I was her. Suddenly I was her. Like, um, And I felt how much love. I was, I was her when she was young, when she was probably, when I was probably about two years old. So I felt all the love she had for me. And I felt... But also I felt her her struggles and her pain and her trauma and everything that she was going through. And um, I had to cry so hard because I felt so sorry that I judged her all the time. Um, that I was not able to, able to see that pain because I, I was struggling with my own pain. Yeah. And... Um, I felt so connected like I, I was and I, I felt that I cannot even describe it I like if, if you're smoking bufo or also if you do ayahuasca and sometimes with mushrooms you're just like you are this person like it's not there's no separation you mm. feel like everyone is connected we're all connected mm -hmm. and uh, you are me and I am you like and that was so so intense how many bufo ceremonies did you do I did two two do two yeah were they on the same day or different days no or? no there were like um the second one i had like four weeks after gotcha and i was like already i already finished the um, the yoga teacher training mm -hmm. and i my boyfriend was also in mexico and um i did it and he was watching wow because i thought Oh, uh, it's getting like it's really it's again super peaceful. I mean, last time I just had to cry um, mm -hmm. after, but like, it's super peaceful. Yeah, I but wanted to then ask you what it was like when you came out of the samadhi space. That's when you started crying and you felt like you were. Your yeah, mom. that's when I, when I came out, like in the first ceremony, I remember how they this the song they they played the song the shamans. Um, it says like heart my heart is opening as i die mm. 
And then it says like I'm um but then they're singing like I'm coming home, I'm coming home. And I still remember this, I'm coming home, I'm coming home and I thought well, I was like I like get goosebumps <laughs> because I was um feeling how I was reborn. Yeah. There was a new birth for me. Um and they they sang this 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 phrase i'm coming home i'm coming home and with such a with such um beautiful voice voices and it really felt like i'm coming home home right now it's like the pain is gone wow and uh, i'm coming home right now it's beautiful like, yeah i was reborn and it was so powerful it was so powerful and how did that experience differ when you did your ayahuasca ceremony what was that like Ayahuasca was really hard for me because it took me, it, I mean, ayahuasca takes about six to eight hours. Okay. And I found that, that this was really strong. I mean, for me, it was really strong. And um, I know that in during ayahuasca, I didn't have like the, the big breakthrough. Mm. It was more than I was like tripping a lot. And um, I was so afraid I pooped myself. Really? And I really was <laughs> sure I, poop, I pooped myself because yeah. everything felt so wet. Mm. And I was like, oh, I think I pooped myself. <laughs> it's so bad. And I couldn't. But the thing was, I couldn't move. Okay. And um, it was like the worst experience ever. And um, <laughs> I couldn't move. I was so cold, but I couldn't grab the the like the towel behind me mm. and i couldn't grab my my hoodie because i was too weak okay and i was just freezing and i was just like thinking i pooped myself but then it turned out it was not really like it was just <laughs> uh an illusion okay. i didn't poop myself yeah. everything like was fine okay but um it was it was much harder mm. much harder um, I was going like I experienced my birth again, which was really traumatic because they had to pull me out with that machine. Mm. I don't know how you call it in English, but they had to pull me out. And um, I didn't breathe for a few minutes. Wow. And I experienced that again and I didn't breathe again. And then I released it and like the release the, um to release it um you you do all kinds of weird of weird stuff i mean you bite yourself you're shaking your head you're like um yeah it sometimes looks maybe like like an um exorcism yeah I mean, you're in a room with other people at this who are also going yeah, through their yeah, journeys, like, right? Yeah, yeah, and it's like, I, I think, like, if you would not be tripping, it would be really weird because you <laughs> have, like, you hear some people are, like, puking, yeah. some people are crying, some people are laughing, some pe people are, like, ah, 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 you know, and, like... It's, Orgasming? Yeah, <laughs> okay. it's, it's, everyone is doing yeah. different noises, okay. and, like, they're, like, it's, th 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 those that are not normal noises. Are you able to, like, drown those out, or do they infringe on your own experience? experience like sometimes um you don't hear them but it can uh, that, that it can definitely impact your experience that's why it's so important i think if you do ayahuasca like please be aware to do it not in a big group mm -hmm. like m i mean it seems like one-on-one -on -one would probably be the best um no i think you can be more yeah yeah you can be more, um, but like not more than like 15 people, I would say. There was more than because 15 people? Yeah, we were like over 30. I that think. is crazy. That is yeah. insane. How would you like keep track of everybody? Because <laughs> That was the thing, actually. I wouldn't do it um, like that again. Because the shamans are also imbibing, right? That's part yeah. of the ceremonies. They yeah. take some too, right? Yeah, they take some too. And they were not able to like really be aware of everyone is is doing well because mm -hmm. i mean i was so cold i was super super cold yeah and i really struggled and um i it didn't feel like i was really supported mm. because we were too many people and i wouldn't do it the same way um now i mean it was it, it's okay that it was that way but um i'm glad because i wanted to do another ayahuasca ceremony like a few days after oh, really? and that would have been 70 people oh wow and i know that like two of my friends who decided to do it they had such a hard time and they really struggled after it mm. because they they were not given the space also to share 
what they have gone through the next really? day. You cannot just you cannot just go on an ayahuasca ceremony and then the next day you're just like, okay, and now back enjoy your vacation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, oh, right. go go back to life. Like this is not how it's supposed to be. In the, psych- and in the, in the psychedelic therapies uh, I've done, they they call it. Uh, you need to have reintegration sessions. Definitely, where you're coming you back need to have that and making meaning out of what you've experienced. Yeah. And and integrate yeah. integrated to learn how to integrate it in your new like in your new life and when right. you're going back home and like you're so overwhelmed after all those um ex- like after all those things you saw and you were going through again and my, I mean it has the potential to maybe also re-traumatize and to totally. to heal you have to have those integration sessions and to talk about it like that's a that's what a good shaman would do but that was like uh, unfortunately not how um we did it but yeah. so that's what uh, why i would always suggest yeah, don't I feel do it like, like that i feel like you know psychedelics they often are talked about people love to talk about the euphoria and the euphoric feelings that you have and people love to talk about the really terrible trips and I do think that as with so many things in your body, like you can kind of apply like the yoga perspective to it all. Like, and like, I, like I've definitely had the experience of taking psychedelics in a context where I like, it almost felt like I pulled a spiritual muscle, you know, like I strained something in, in my psyche mm-hmm. and then it took time to move past that into like heal from it and and that doesn't mean that a painful experience or tr- or a difficult experience on psychedelics is going to hurt you but it is really important to have the the reintegration to have the support so that even if it is something that was hard or traumatic you can still code it in your brain to fit the positive narratives because even yeah. a difficult experience there's a lesson there and so you Definitely. can gain something really profound out of it but if you also are thinking about afterwards like oh that sucked that was terrible that hurt me you're like you said with that the broke me your body's gonna yeah. you know is going to change to match yeah. what those thought patterns Definitely. are right? And I was always like, I think it's so important to not give that such a big meaning. If you had a hard time, you had a b- hard time. Mm-hmm. So um, I was like, um, it's part of the healing process. And I remember going back home um, and then then realizing um, I got pregnant after all this healing, like the healing ceremonies and yeah. stuff. And falling into that huge pregnancy pregnancy depression but not giving it so much meaning just releasing to it and and seeing it as it's part of the healing process now ayahuasca is kicking me in the ass again right. now i have to first repeat the same patterns and to experience the same feelings and emotions again to then let it go for my like the rest of my life yeah you know it's like sometimes people they have that expectation like i'm doing ayahuasca then i'm going out and i'm feeling s- super healthy and i'm I feeling like i'm feeling it's healed gonna fix all my and problems like, <laughs> yeah i like i'm just like um, i'm going out and i don't have any problems anymore but yeah. that's not how like that's the worst thi- worst thing you can do is um to have an expectation on your healing journey and how yeah. how does it have to look because you don't know how it will look ayahuasca will decide for you how it will look and maybe you go how you go home and you're feeling shitty like Mm -hmm. like you've never felt before but then that's part of the healing process and just trusting and surrendering to this process and being like that's part of it right now that that is like that is a yogi mindset and right. this, this is really important. I Sometimes think. medicine tastes bad, you know? It's true. <laughs> what, what what do you think uh, in your mind, what's the difference between, like in this context, when you're going into a psychedelic experience, the difference between having an expectation and setting an intention? Because mm-hmm. the two could, you know, are similar, but there's a little bit difference in, I think, in, in how you orient your mind. I think setting an intention, I mean, you could do that with, Writing a letter, for mm-hmm. example, um, like, dear ayahuasca, <laughs> and then, yeah, and then you can ask for stuff you want to know. You mm-hmm. can like, I want to find out this. I want to 
get to know um, this person better. I want to I want to experience this. I want to see that. I want to have the explanation for this and that. Like that's an intention that you set is you know so that you can you can impact your journey a little bit mm -hmm. so that you don't go just into it and ayahuasca shows you whatever but you can like a little bit you influence your brain to like um see the things you have to see right now mm -hmm. but an attention doesn't mean that you are disappointed when you're coming out and you've not experienced that gotcha. like it's just okay that was my intention mm -hmm. But it showed me something else. And right. that's okay. Yeah. Because um, I needed to know and um, I needed to see that. Yeah. And having an expectation is always creating like disappointment. Because mm. you're going out and you're like, but I wanted that mm -hmm. and I did not get it. So gotcha. I'm not doing it again. And th there's no healing um, behind it. It's, like, it, it's fr frustrating to expect something because you're limiting yourself. Maybe Ayahuasca has to show you something that is so much bigger and so much more important right now, but because you're so focused on that intention and you're, you're like, no, I, but I want this, I want that. <laughs> you're like blocking yourself and you're limiting your, like, your healing process, mm. you know? Yeah, yeah, that's, that face was hilarious. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, it's kind of like, I, I, the way that you described it, it's, it makes me think of like, into it or an intention is like you're you're creating a vessel that the that the experience can fill mm -hmm. and maybe you have a certain shape that you're gonna mm -hmm. that you're gonna fill and that shape might change but you're at least creating a shape and then with an expectation it's almost like a set of limiting beliefs like it makes me think of mm -hmm. the first time I took mushrooms I think I was like 16 or 17 with my two brothers went out to the beach and I was just like this is gonna be awesome it's gonna be the most fun thing ever and I remember as it started to come on I was like this isn't fun this isn't an awesome <laughs> this feels really weird like and I got hung up on this idea that I wasn't I was supposed to be having more fun but I wasn't having fun and, and that's first, when you suffer the most yeah and I was <laughs> I was stuck on it at first I was like oh, it's my water bottle that's the reason why I'm not having fun. So I took my water bottle and I just threw it as far away as I could. And then I thought it was, you know, my sandwich. So I took my sandwich and I threw my sandwich away as far as I could. And then what I eventually realized was that my two brothers were wanting to go in one direction and I was feeling like I wanted to go in another and mm -hmm. there was like a conflict. And nobody had said anything, but I could just realized that energy. and so I energy. told my brothers that I loved them and I went off on my own and like I got maybe like a you know 100 feet down the beach and suddenly I started feeling really good and like I looked up and the clouds were like pulsing purple and then like I had this walking stick and I remember I got to this place and suddenly I found a new walking stick and it was like the symbol of everything changing and I decided I wanted to get naked and I took off all my clothes and I was just sitting on a log and looking at the sky dance and I just was by myself and feeling so good about that I had like done this. I had taken like my own story. Mm -hmm. I, I had started living my own adventure and I sat with it for a while and then then I started to feel like I wanted to go back and tell my, my brothers about my adventure. So I gathered all my clothes up under one arm. I think maybe I put my underwear back on and I walked back up the beach and I saw my brothers and they were like rolling in the sand. Like they were pigs, like pretending they were <laughs> pigs. And, uh, and they said that when they saw me coming, it looked like there was like a prince, mm -hmm. like r riding <laughs> in on a horse kind of, yeah, I can't imagine like, that. like Aladdin, like Prince yeah. Ali, you know? And, uh, and from that moment on, like the whole rest of the trip was just like pure love and enjoyment. I told them what I did. They told me about like the bushes they looked at and the like, adventures that they had. And that's one of my favorite things now. If I'm, if I do do like a more social psychedelic experience with people, usually out in nature, I do try to build into it 
alone time. If I start to feel anxiety or I yeah, feel overwhelmed, definitely. I go That's off so by important. myself. I can meditate. I can use my mm-hmm. tools. And then it's always such a joy to come back mm-hmm. and everybody's got like adventures mm-hmm. to share. And mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I think that's it's true. Really beautiful. Well, I think that we're almost at the end of our time. Well, I don't know where we're at right now. Let's, let's see where we're, where we're sitting at right now. Yeah. So the last thing I'm going to ask you, and we can, we can end on this note because I feel like it would be wrong not to at least ask this question before we finish. Can you just talk a little bit about this decision? You know, you're six months pregnant and you're like, I'm going to go to Costa Rica and have an adventure. My boyfriend's not coming. And like, like what was the intention behind that? But then also like what your experience as this young growing mother has been uh, during your time here. Like what has this whole experience been for you? I felt like because I always loved to travel alone Mm -hmm. and I did it a lot. Mm -hmm. I was, I mean, I went to the Bahamas alone. Why do you like to travel alone? Mm, I started it and it felt, for for me, it felt like I'm meeting more people. Okay. I'm connecting with more people. I'm building strength and I'm becoming like more independent. And um, also what was, what impacted me was always during my travels. I also love to travel with my, I mean, I mean, I would love to have my boyfriend here, but if he's not able to do it, I'm not going to stay at home um, being unhappy about that. I cannot travel right now yeah. just because nobody can come with me. Mm-hmm. And like, so, so often um, I didn't like, I didn't have any friends who were able to come with me and then i was i decided okay then i'm gonna go alone i'm not staying here just because nobody's nobody can join me right um i mean life is too short for that and especially in relationships you have to learn how to make yourself happy Mm. and um, still do your stuff Mm -hmm. and so i decided that i had like um left vacation and i want to spend it uh, maybe in costa rica to yeah to uh, to develop like healthy patterns again like because like in the beginning i suffered like a lot from pregnancy depression and then you get into those like unhealthy patterns like starting the day with a phone for example mm-hmm. and like i really felt that i want to develop a spiritual practice um again in the morning like a morning routine before i get the baby and um i want to have some time on my own i want to like visualize and yeah create the my perfect birth experience in my mind um and i want to i want to i need time for that and i need space for that and that's something that is hard to do at home when you have other stuff like and uh, other things going on around you so i decided to come here and um i was not afraid at all but um I feel like right now I know there are some things I would have done totally different when I like, yeah, when I knew what I have, I have to expect. Like, for example, I would not just go spontaneous um, without booking. Like, I mean, we did that. We just went like, <laughs> oh, we're, s- we're spontaneous and it went out fine. But yeah. like we had two nights where we were like, getting frustrated because we didn't find a place to stay right and during pregnancy you're feeling more vulnerable and you're feeling like um it's uh like exhausted after after just a few minutes of like this like the stress like you you have don't you don't have that resilience anymore Mm -hmm. so i would do things different but i still would travel alone and um sometimes i have those moments where i have like all kinds of irrational fears coming up like what if something happens tomorrow mm. i ha- i mean i had that one time right now like it's You're just talking one about that time today, yeah. yeah yesterday that i was like oh what 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 if like a snake bites me or <laughs> you know yeah. um or something happens and yeah. like i have to give birth to my baby here mm-hmm. um 
too way too early but um also i'm I'm just releasing to those th thoughts i mean I'm, i'm just letting them come up just observing them yeah and um, try to not i identify um with all my with all those fears because sometimes it's just like pregnancy is such a big exciting journey mm -hmm. um it's like i would call it a, like a like a nine month ayahuasca ceremony <laughs> like <laughs> it's really like that you, because so you, much you're trauma. cold you're weak you think you shit yourself <laughs> yeah no it's like really like not not the physical things yeah. but like it's more all those traumas coming up again all the unhealthy patterns all those triggers mm. like um And I don't know if it's me or if it's like um, the same for uh, for other women too. You are becoming aware of some so many things because you want to be the best parent you can be for your child and especially the best mother. And um, maybe it's like ev an evolutionary pro process to to now heal yeah. the stuff you still um, haven't um, healed yet and. Um, Yeah, to me it feels like it's that it's that kind of journey. So you mm. will experience those weird moments, but that doesn't mean you have to stay at home and then just like, you know, you can still enjoy your trip, even if they're yeah. like bad and and made maybe hard days. I mean, mm -hmm. I had a hard time to come here. Yeah, I was I was puking seven times. I thought like I'm two two days. I was so super sick uh, from the airport super to, sick. to essence. From the airport to Essence, then there I had this like, yeah, y like li the digestive problem where I th thought I I couldn't eat anything, mm -hmm. felt like really sick. Here I had it again. So sometimes yeah, there are days like this, but it's okay. I mean, you have the tools to to get through any of these things as 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 you've described, and I I think it's beautiful. It's been such a cool experience for me you know uh just as a guy getting to i don't know i think i came out of my yoga retreat and i had this like deep intuitive feeling that like i felt protective of your baby you know we'd been through like this ceremony together we'd been through like yeah. some experiences so i felt like the natural like urge of a man wanting to protect mm -hmm. like a woman in a vulnerable place But then also just like the deep curiosity about like almost viewing this time together as like it's been in my own way, my own kind of shamanic journey of like, like, okay, like when in my life am I, am I going to be able to like travel with like a pregnant woman who's not like my pregnant woman, yeah. you know what I mean? Like it, there was some lessons to learn and there was, a, a, it, it, I saw it as like, uh it a really interesting opportunity you know I in the way that i view my travels because for me traveling is all about saying yes to the opportunities that present themselves so when i saw it happen with you i was like okay like i'm totally happy with my costa rica trip going in any direction this is a it seems like an interesting opportunity to experience and uh and it's been great it's been such a cool It's it's been so cool seeing you like hold your space as a mother and watching you develop your uh identity as a mother and your like boundaries of what you're putting into your body and what your which situations you're going to be, you know, allowing you in this new being to experience. And I've been really impressed at how how much like it, I forget you're pregnant a lot of times because you're so active. You know, it's <laughs> like then I remember, oh yeah, she's got this be this baby in her belly, but like you're still going out and swimming. And I remember being at the, we were at this hot river, and I was helping you across, and then like five minutes later, I look over and you're just like, like a frog, <laughs> just walking uh, across the rocks and super mobile. <laughs> and you know, it's it's. I've had a you know several friends over the last couple years who have become mothers and it's just cool to meet someone who's still I can just tell that you're still uh really committed to your own work and your own experience 
And it's not that you're sacrificing the experience of motherhood or your baby to, to have that, but you're also not sacrificing that to have your baby. You know, like you're, I see you really engaged both as Lisa, the individual, the, 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 the journeyer, the seeker. Mm-hmm. And you're also integrating that with Lisa, the mother, the caretaker, the supporter. Yeah, th- with the new identification. Yeah, trying to do that. So it's uh, it's it's been a it's been a trip. It's been cool uh, getting to to have that experience, and you know. Mm, yeah, and you did a great service, actually. <laughs> I mean, it was not always easy for you. You're trying to flirt with the girls, and they were like. <laughs> What a weird guy is that having his <laughs> like, I mean, how uh, who would think that we are not a couple, you know, right, I mean, I'm pregnant. Right. I mean, yeah. we never acted in a romantic way, but no, no. I mean, just seeing a woman who is pregnant and I think that almost made it more the plausible, same age. Like you know? and then um, then like you're trying to, to connect yeah. with those women and they're like, oh, yeah. what kind of a weirdo are you? Every, like, every your girl girlfriend's I met, pregnant, yeah, pregnant and then I made paying eyes for yourself like. Yeah, <laughs> they all thought I was schmucks, course, like, and a terrible yeah. partner, and, and I mean that that me like um that meant a lot to me like because <laughs> I knew you I I knew you you could have probably met some girls and mm. like um create creating some s- connections mm-hmm. but um you oh, were just okay. like you yeah, were just like releasing and surrendering to to, to the process and to yeah. th- to the service like um, you did to me that was amazing. Yeah, I mean, it was, you know, it was, to me, it was more funny than anything. And I think that's <laughs> probably because I was coming out of this amazing, like, yoga retreat and feeling so just at peace. Like, it it didn't matter to me that, like, it was just funny to me when I would flirt with someone and they would, li- like, look at me with those accusatory <laughs> eyes. And I knew, you know, we both knew, that I, I think in some ways, the fact that we were not acting romantic made it a stronger narrative for people because I would just see people like, Oh, they're not, they're not doing well. You know, (laughs) (laughs) you know, so many couples have those issues during pregnancy where they're feeling a disconnect. So I would see, you know, shop owners or girls, like just people like, Oh, you know, they're sleeping in separate beds. So things aren't going well, you know, (laughs) it's so funny because then you're like, those those people are all like judging yeah, totally. in kind of a way but you're like you you have no idea like yeah. you just don't know but on the other hand too you know i think that i would be remiss if i wasn't also acknowledging that you know when you're traveling as as a single guy by yourself that's like the ultimate unknown quantity you could be a dangerous person people Mm-hmm. I mean, when I travel, I tend to find that people are always like very open and 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 into connecting. But there, it is true that you do get a little bonus too. Like it, traveling yeah. with a pregnant woman, I'm like instantly not a threat to mm-hmm. anybody. They mm-hmm. all are like, okay, like he's with his wife and he, or he's with she's yeah. got a kid. Like he's taking care of his family. You're like, just the weird family yeah, father, exactly. who is yeah. like <laughs> f- trying to flirt with other yeah. girls. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that it's was a really trade-off, funny. but um, but yeah, that I think that this this podcast we've been trying to do it for a couple of days, and we've had our the road bumps. But I also think that it's really beautiful that we're doing this on our last night yeah. of this shared trip. We're parting ways tomorrow, and uh, so you know, getting to do this together was really special and. Definitely. I'm super glad we did it. Super grateful. Yeah. And thank you so much for coming on my show and being interested and being interesting. And thank you uh, for the opportunity. Yeah. It's been a sweet couple of weeks or three weeks uh, getting to know you and hanging out. And I think that uh, hopefully this is the first of many such conversations. I definitely want to have you on again and hear about the birth process yeah that would be cool check back in after you've had your baby talking about the home birth yes we got to do a home birth episode for sure Mm -hmm. um how so the last thing that i need to say just because i'm trying to be a good host here um we didn't even mention this but you have a youtube channel yeah lisa da silva lisa da silva and uh, but i'm it's in german so if you're like me and you're you like listening to german Maybe uh, it'll be something for you if you're an English speaker. And if you're a German speaker, then so much the better. And hopefully 
at some point too, we talked about this. You'll get, you'll be able to get the, like the Google translation. Yeah, that would be super. You cool. can have a transcription yeah. going in Let's English, see. some subtitles. Yeah. All right, Lisa. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. It's been lovely, and um, all you guys go check out her channel, and uh, yeah, uh, all the best. Thanks for coming on, and thank you. And uh, we'll do this again soon. Yes.